Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Naomi Sawara, and I manage public programs at the Belkin Art Gallery. Welcome to the Morris and Helen Belkin Art Gallery and to the artist talk by Tom Burroughs. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you at the Belkin Art Gallery, Tom. And it's, I guess it's a kind of homecoming of sorts. Uh, for those um, of you who don't know, uh, this is the first retrospective that includes um, selected works curated by Scott Watson, who's uh, to my right, uh, of Tom's work over the past 40, more than 40 years, 40, 50 years. And um, from 1964 to 1967, Tom was a student here, who, and he took sociology and fine arts at the University of British Columbia. And he studied with Alvin, ba ba uh, Alvin Balkan, Ian Baxter, other people you want to mention? That's pretty good. That's pretty good, okay. <laughs> Um, and it's during this time that he began to show annually at the Vancouver Art Gallery. By the time he graduated with his undergrad, he was showing at the National Gallery of Canada. Um, it's also uh, during this time um, that he began to become interested also in sculpture and um, issues in terms of society. Uh, after two years of studying sculpture at St. Martin's College from 1969 to 1970, he returned to Vancouver, and then he became one of the founding faculty in the newly formed Bachelor of Fine Arts program here at the university. I think before then, it was, uh, I guess a program hadn't been yeah, they, formally... They, they, just studio courses. Yeah. Yeah. It was just studios. Yeah. And um, this period also coincides with him living in the Maplewood Love Flats on North Shore, which many of you probably are familiar with. And uh, his time there and project that he did for the United Nations in 1975 have been the subject of articles, essays, as well as exhibitions. Um, Tom's approach to art is process-based, and what that means is that the properties of the materials that he's using, um, and not narrative or a story, are what really determines uh, the form of his work. Uh, and this is evidenced, as you will see, in those beautiful polymer resin panels uh, in the exhibition um, that he has been engaged with. He's been producing that since the 1960s. Uh, and they continue to um, really capture the imagination of curators, gallery goers, and collectors to today, as well as the 2010, the more recent uh, works on panel that are glazed porcelain. Tom has been a vital part of the Vancouver art community as an artist, an activist, and an educator. His works have been exhibited in London, Rome, Tokyo, Berlin, Seattle, New York, Edinburgh, and uh, in Marseille, as well as across Canada. And his uh, works are included in private, corporate, and public collections throughout Europe, the Americas, and Asia. So please welcome Tom Burroughs. In a, in a way, uh, I haven't come very far. In 1960, uh, I was in residence, student residence in Fort Cap, which is about a couple hundred yards from here. That's uh, 65 years, and here I am, a couple hundred yards away. <laughs> yeah, it was a beautiful place it's, to live at that time. It's where the Museum of Anthropology is now. And I, I, I just come out from Ontario and to look out my window. <clears throat> you're going to have to excuse me. I at one time cut my nose off, and, and I get terrible sinus infections, uh, which I have right now. So if my eyes begin to water, it's not emotion. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was just looking out that window at uh, Point Athos and huh, couldn't leave. It started off uh, as, as a kid, when I was about nine years old, uh, my sister was doing classes with, with Fred Barley, Group of Seven guy that uh, he, he, was, he was teaching at the Doom School of Fine Arts uh, outside of Kitchener. And she, uh, she met Tony Longley. Um, and they were they were young and uh, they had to get married. He was twenty, she was eighteen. Uh, and Tony gave me watercolor classes. 
I, I draw the sketch with it. And it you know, it's, you know, it's just something to do. Uh, about five years later, I, my sister got very young. Uh, they had two kids. Uh, Tony came out here. My mother looked after one of the kids. And I, I was just sort of bumbling around through high school. I, I didn't know quite, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was more interested in cars and girls than anything else. And then uh, I remember running away to Detroit, a couple hundred miles away, uh, with a friend, because we were so into the, the music from Detroit. It was amazing. Uh, finally, my parents found us and came back. I came back and I got expelled from high school. Uh, um, <coughs> And then, then, uh, then, I, then I went out of the labor force and, and I realized how brutal labor is. And I got pretty, it, it motivated me. I became a good student after that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I, I managed, my family had enough money at the time to send me to a cram school. And I did a couple years in one. And then I went into grade 13, which is a, what the first year of university is here then in Ontario and uh, shortly into it I, I had a sports accident where I ended up uh, having to have a piece of my head removed and things tied off and side uh, which kind of screwed up my academic year I had, yeah, I, and my eyes were crossed. It was strange when I came out. I, I went through uh, six months of life with crossed eyes, which slowly straightened out. I guess it was some muscle damage or whatever. Which slowly straightened out, but I, I couldn't wear anything corrective. So it, 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 was, it was a real exercise in uh, experiencing the three-dimensional world because, you know, our bifocal vision gives us that. Um, actually, one of the... A little while after that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go back. Okay, so I, I, I finished grade thirteen. I, you know, I, I got a few of my courses, not enough really, uh, because I spent <clears throat> a lot of that time in the hospital, and it, I really had to learn to talk again and walk. It was, but when it was over, I guess I, I guess I was a <laughs> stupidly brutal young man. Like I, I just carried on like nothing happened and it ended up on a the summer after that in a sort of Kerouac like cruise across Canada with, with a couple of friends in an old beat up jalopy um, and got back to the yeah that's when I ended up in Fort Camp and when I, when I was Tony Olive was out here then and before I got to Fort Camp, I was crashing on his couch in his studio for as long as he could you know, put up with it. And I, man I managed to talk myself into university and in the for into a, a pre-med course because uh, that's the only thing my father was interested in me being. So I, I, you know, he wanted a doctor in the family. I got into pre-med and sort of fumbled around. I met people, in the beginning I met Boshi Wong in Tony's studio, that was, he was just a Huang Boshi, the patriarch of the Boshi Gallery. That was 1960 and here, here, was, a, here was a guy that, uh, he could hardly speak English. Then a few years later he opened up his gallery with that kind of success. Anyways, I, you know, I met a lot of other people through Tony in the Vancouver art scene, and, and I was out here. Anyways, when I bungled through that year of pre-medicine terribly, and uh, headed back for Toronto because uh, my high school sweetheart was going to U of T, and we'd write every day. I went back there, and it, 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 didn't, it didn't quite work out. Uh, then my family got me a job in <clears throat> on Bay Street in the brokerage. And that, that was very painful. Uh, uh, then I managed to uh, get myself on a boat 
out of Port Everglades and worked my way around the world, going across the Pacific, and tried to jump ship in Tahiti. It was so wonderful that I ended up, uh, I guess they're used to people trying to jump ship there because I woke up and seen Tahiti disappearing in the distance. Somehow they got me back on the boat. And I got to, you know, kept going around the world. Ended up uh, again, up through the, up, yeah, through the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, through the, through the Mediterranean, uh, stopping in places along the way like Lisbon and Piraeus, Naples, um, and uh, jump ship in uh, Southampton, and made it up to London. Uh, I had no money. It was, it was very odd. I made it up there, and, and, and my very first night, I had a couple of pounds in my pocket, and I, I was sitting in a pub, and I, I reached in, the, you know, I felt seat I was on. I reached into the crowd, and I pulled a five-pound note, and I, I felt I'm here. And then I got a job uh, working for uh, a wimpy bar as a porter, picking up wrappers with a point of stick. Uh, and then, uh, then I then I met my uh, the I, I, I met my uh, my first wife, who was there. Um, she 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 studied journalism in Italy, but she she was working as an au pair and then in a restaurant. And I, I managed to bluff my way into a job at the London Hilton Hotel, which had just opened. Uh, and as a bar tender, I, know, I don't know how I did that because I didn't really have any experience like I said I did because I wasn't really old enough to have ever been in a bar. But, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I was and we're living in Bohemian London. It was it was it was kind of fun. But one one of, one of the occasions, um, my friend Lenny came up from Morocco. He 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 was. He was totally fascinated with, with Paul Bowles, so he, he drove down there. And he came back and a little Renault Dauphine in the back seat was full of sort of grocery bags full of marijuana. I, I'd never seen marijuana before. I wasn't around when I was a kid. So, so this stuff showed up and we were, so we were smoking pot. And part of my, part of my thing at the Hilton Hotel, if they, I had a job in the international bar, and they gave everyone a costume uh, of the country you came from. And I had a very stylized, tight little modern policeman's uniform. With <laughs> and, and you know, and when the guys, the West Indian guys working in the kitchen, found out I had pot, they were so excited. So here I was in my modern policeman's uniform, passing out pot. Um, then, uh, yeah, th then, then uh, my wife who had studied, well, we, we didn't really get married then. She, she studied journalism and, she, and we were getting along really well and she managed to um, get a job with, uh, from England. She was offered a job with Courier Canadese in Toronto. It's a huge Italian circulation. At that time, 80,000 weekly circulation on this thing. That's how many Italian people. So if that's Italian families. So uh, but she couldn't really go to Canada because you had to go through all the kind of visa sort of things. And we've yeah, so we decided, okay, we'll we'll just get married and that that way we'll get in. So we got married and came to Toronto again. Um, we're in, in Toronto and I got a uh, I got another job in a brokerage. It was a total mistake. Um, and um, and then, then after a while, they they tried. They they liked me, but they, they tried everything. And went, I, I learned really fast on whatever job they gave me. But after about a couple of weeks, I got really bored and did it wrong. So so they ended up. Uh, they liked me so much, they sent me to an industrial psychologist. Um, and I did all these tests. And when I got the results, it said I should be either a clergyman or a sculptor, and I never thought of being a sculptor. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was the first year student loans came out. And uh, so 
both so both my wife and I got student loans and and uh, we got an old Volvo and made a sort of bed platform in the back and did another sort of Kerouac trip across North America to Vancouver and uh, <clears throat> started a university. I mean, I, th I, th I think I started in creative writing, but very quickly grab, you know, gravitated to art history and sociology. And in one of the classes, I was doing uh, studio, I was doing as much studio as possible. Uh, it was 1965. Um, oh, and also when I came out here, Tony Audley was back here and he offered my wife and I, he had a flat upstairs and he needed someone in there. So we moved in there and Tony's downstairs with his wife. And um, Ian Baxter first came out here. It was his first, he was, he was a young guy from, I don't know, Idaho University or something. And he was teaching a studio course. And in that course, I met Ian Wallace. And between Baxter and Ian and myself and Tony, uh, we just started all hanging out at Tony's house and you know, exchanging things. Tony had every art magazine. So we could look at every art magazine. And things began to blossom. We, we started thinking art. And then uh, both Ian and I started, we started acing on, on, on every time they had a, once a year at the, at the Vancouver Art Gallery, they, they had jewelry exhibitions. And we tried, you know, we went, you know, we went in 65, 60, we, we just kept, we just kept getting by the jewelry and hanging on the wall three years in a row, even though one of those was so selective, it was idiotic how selective it was. And we got that one. And, and, and we were producing, it, the work wasn't for university, it, it was, we were, we were producing work outside of that. Um, Ian, Ian went on to, you know, lecturing here, right out of there, and, and uh, the work that I made, I got photographs and I, I, I sent them off to St. Martin's in London <coughs> and got into, uh, got into that school, which, you know, there was, they had, they, there was 25 applicants out of, you know, 25 students in postgraduate, and there was uh, hundreds of people applied. So it, again, that, that, that was knocking. And I found myself in the company of people that would become incredibly up there famous. Um, guys like you know, Richard Long and Gilbert and George. And, Roland Brenner was at the school at the same time. Uh, and, and another thing that happened, when I went there, when, I, when we eventually got there, it was a roundabout way. We, we, we took a boat from New York to, to Morocco, to, to uh, Genoa, and then up, up to London. And when, when I got there and, and you know, I went in to uh, try to find housing in London, uh, they said, well, there, there's this factory out in Mile End which was pretty brutal in my at that time. Um, and I said, well, I mean, I said, well, it's, and I went out and looked at it and I said, well, it's just, it's just an, a big empty room. And they said, well, you're a sculptor, build something. And so, I, and I said, I, I, I can actually build something. And I, I, didn't, I didn't think that before. So, it, so, um, so eventually, you know, a, after going through this London experience, and <laughs> you know, it, 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 it was, it got, um, London in the 60s is such a marvel, was such a marvelous experience. When, 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 I, when I was, the education I got in Ontario, in, in the age group that I came up in, we, we were actually trained, we were actually taught to be anti-American. They, 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 they didn't want us, they didn't want people going across the border, they didn't want a brain drain. They, 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 and then we were taught to be Anglophiles, you know, like the Empire. Uh, I loved London until Thatcher took over, and now I, I don't like England either. It's uh, more American. But okay, so here, here we're, we're um, 
we're, we're in London, we're going in. I've, I've got the studio in, uh, the studio in, in, in Mile End, uh, we can go away for the weekend and uh, forgot to turn a tap off. And there was a <coughs> teddy bear factory below us. And when we came back, there was a big room full of teddy bears floating face down. And, and we, we had to get out quick. So, so um, we managed to, uh, we managed to find, actually Jerry Pethick was leaving and he said, well, you know, sub at my place. So we got to the other side of London where, and people don't, I mean, the people in the East End of London would never find us on the other side of London. It's, 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 so so we, we were in this studio and it, it was, it was good. Um, that's where I started my, my first resin pieces. And yeah, and if they had the metal ends, all, all of what I have now, uh, this, this went on and until Jerry and I, we, we, we kind of, at that time, were drank a lot. And, and, and we, we went out on to celebrate my birthday. Um, and um, ended up a couple days later in my uh, post office van in Heathrow, and we'd gone back and Jerry had packed his things. I, I put a few things, and we we ended up in New York and broke three days later. Um, I uh, Jerry went off to Ann Arbor where we had some things happen. I, I went up to Ontario and painted houses and enough money to get back to Vancouver where Elvin Balkan, the once director, is, am I going on too long in this? Yeah. 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 Am I going on too long? Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop about half now. Okay. It's, it's 2 p.m., okay. All right, anyways, I made it back to uh, here, found the mud flats, needed a place to live, my, my wife was with a child, I built the house, and, came back. and from the mud flats, uh, then I came out here, I was given a job here, and started teaching, and we'll start the thing now, with the mud flats. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the mud flats, well, okay, um, after a few years, uh, as I say, my building experience from, from London, I, I thought when I got here, I was, there was a platform, there was a beautiful roof at the mud flats, there was no one around uh, at the time for a couple of weeks, and I managed, the, the, the roof was, it was a beautiful cedar shag roof, uh, a lovely platform, but no walls, just studs, uh, but there was so much material lying around out there that I, I put walls up and windows on. And uh, when my wife arrived with child at the airport, I was able to bring her to a, you know, a house with doors and windows. And, uh, and then, then it carried on. And, you know, there's a second story went on it eventually. Uh, it was, and it was a wonderful flat plain out in front for sculpture. It was, it was, my, it was a tablet room set, but there it was. And every day the tide came in and went out, it, it would seem so idealistic. And, and after, you know, and then I was offered a job out here and it, life seemed beautiful. <laughs> but it, it was odd for, you know, living as a squatter and being a university professor was kind of a twist. <laughs> um, um, and then, then eventually it came to the point where the place was burned. Uh, be, because, you know, we, we were, you know, Supposedly illegal. I, I don't think it was. There's a long story there. Um, but after that, uh, okay, I'll tell the story a bit. Okay, the, we, we we're in Supreme Court, and, and the whole thing about squatting and why it was on the foreshore is uh, it, it has to do with, with the indefinite property rights, uh, which, which is usually defined as mean high tide, is, is what. The queen owns up to mean high tide in, in terms of the harbor board and whatever district on the other side of that owns that. And to actually declare a place as illegal, it has to be, there has to be a survey to say who actually, you know, is it the harbor board going to be responsible for getting rid of it or is it the district of North Vancouver? And, and this went into, this was picked up by a lawyer and we got to Supreme Court 
and it, it went on for a couple of years back and forth. Uh, the poor building, building inspector from North Vancouver was in court off and on, off and he was, he was getting so fed up with it. Um, but when, when we were in court, they noticed the, the survey done by the, the Harbor Board and the District of Vancouver, North Vancouver were done 10 years difference in time, and there was a stream coming beside my house and that stream had made enough alluvial fill that if you put the two maps together, there was a, quite a large area of land that neither of them were claiming because of the alluvial fill in, in the mean high tide line. So, so we got together and we, with a bunch of friends and students, people like Barry Jones was there, like, we rolled the house on, on logs out, for, you know, 90 feet out onto this, put signs up, and when uh, the inspector came to demolish the houses, here was a house that, you know, signs around it. He, I have to, I think, quite understandably, he just flipped out and threw a torch to him. It was, it was, uh, so, so anyways, a few years after that incident, um, there was a Habitat Forum came here, and because of, uh, because of my studies in, in sociology and art history, I, I, I got the job of correlating information coming in from around the world on squatting, and uh, and after that I, I, I got some money to go up and actually do a photographic and you know text case studies on, on what I heard, and that, that's what brought this. Uh, and as you it, it comes to a conclusion in panels at the end. Basically, you know, saying that squatting is a factor of when, when there's such a demand that, that people, there's such a separation between the amenities they need and the distance they are from them. They, eventually people will start to act illegally and go to, uh, to, to the amenities rather than stay way out where they can't get anything, uh, if that's true. And I, I think Scott wanted this because, because he, 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 this particular exhibit on, on uh, this document, Scott, uh, in, in terms of, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's so, it's getting, at one time people would spend, you know, the, the formula was you'd spend a third of your income on housing. Uh, for, for a lot of people in Vancouver, it's now, they're spending 80% of their income. And, and at least very little over to send your kids to figure skating lessons there. <laughs> it, it's, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's not good for culture. But something has to, something has to give. Uh, should we move on? Um, yeah, th this is this is one of the earliest pieces in the show. And again, again, we're talking about the jewelry shows at, at the bay. Uh, that was in it. I, I'd already gone to England. I, I didn't see it in the show. Uh, and then when it when I got back, uh, someone was keeping it for me, and they did a really good job of keeping it. But then I, I brought it out to the mud flats, and it, and it, it dissolved. So this is a rebuild. Uh, and, and it's, but you, you can see where, where I'm going with it in, in terms of a, a, a sculptural object being basically out there in space in, in three dimensions. I'm, I'm, on this one, I'm, I'm pushing towards trying to eliminate dimensions. Like there, there's nothing really behind it. And, and in a way, and, and it's flat finish. It, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to flatten out a three-dimensional image to make make something plainer, um, which led to led to the the polymer pieces on the walls. It, it, these all of these pieces are are playing with the, the fact that uh, they're flat on the wall, but but they are dimensional. What what you're seeing. In this one and that one, you're seeing the struts that, that actually are necessary to support the works, and that that becomes the that becomes the image. More so, 
mainly in this one. Uh, the two, the one on the wall the down there, the blue one, and uh, and the, the the other, the purplish one with the with the yellow center, uh, were done in London, and I brought them back with me. Uh, there's a few that have survived London. This piece happened. Um, just when I got back in Canada is, is when uh, you know, the Americans landed on the moon. Uh, and the title of this piece is There's No Wind There. I know. It's, uh, because, can you remember like the, 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 the flag that was waving in the wind? It's the, the theory that the, the whole thing was, was done in Hollywood, maybe. <laughs> um, this piece uh, came later. I, I, th I think I was uh, beginning to question myself as an object maker. So I, I had to make a really difficult object just to prove myself. So, so, so th th this, is, this is a pyramid in, in 32 pieces. An exercise, I, I guess, because I, I did art history, I did sociology. I never really went to art school. I, I didn't get the training of, of, of uh, what a, you know someone's trained as a sculptor. So I, I, you know, I had to prove to myself. I, it's kind of, uh, but I like it. I like it, and I, I, I also I like it especially in the context of, of, of this video piece, which was which again is in the formation of the pyramid, but but in a in a different sense. And, and, the, and the piece on the wall with the X on, it, it's, it's really, if you look at it, it's, it's in a way looking down on top of a pyramid. I, I don't know, why, I'm, I'm, I'm not in any way uh, mystical or spiritual believing pyramids on that level, but, but they're, they're interesting shapes to me. So. Uh, the, ring, uh, the ring actually is from, uh, it, it comes from the mud flats. It, I found it out there. There was, uh, there was, it's a half a dozen of those rings, which were rings to uh, contain wood slats in, in a water tower. And the wood had rotted away, but the, the rings were there, and they were so beautiful, and they, they became my idiom. I, I still, still have four of them. I, you know, I carry things through life sillily, but I, I, I had no idea why I was doing that until the show came up. The ring, wonderful. Uh, is there anybody want to ask anything? Did pot come into the influence of any of these things? Did what? Pot. Uh, <laughs> pot, yeah, when, when, I, when I experienced pot in England, uh, went out with a friend who, you know, who was studying art. And, okay, I'm, I'm, t I'm said 22, 23, and kids now, like, you know, they're, they're smoking pot really young. Uh, but, and so, but this really, we, we looked in, in this window of, of, of an art shop and there, there was an open book of, uh, in, in the, a picture of Duchamp's nude descending a staircase. And we, we were both so completely struck by this that the, the, the store owner had to come out and sort of wipe our nose marks off the window. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, you know, pot, pot doesn't mean a lot to me. I, I, I smoke, you know, I smoke pot now when I play music. That's all, and, and it, it, it really helps to play music for me. But uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, it's not in my everyday life. So, so back to uh, back to UBC when I was teaching here, and a really a really close friend and mentor in so many ways, Glenn Hawkins was teaching with me, uh, and, and he 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 understood he understood resin so well. Um, he, yeah, he I, I, yeah he, he got me off on it. Um, so. I'm doing the work in the other room. Um, he, he 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 was kind of well. He he lived in his studio under under Granville Bridge, and uh, he, he he was 
casting resin in the same place he was sleeping and eating. Uh, a great professor. <laughs> Anyways, he, he got lung cancer. And, uh, and we found him, we found him on his, on, dead on the floor of his studio. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what, 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 what am I doing? I, I'm, wor I'm working with, I mean, th th this is, this is a, a product of the petrochemical industry. Um, the juggernaut, the, and I, I'm saying, what, what am I doing? What am I doing? I'm teaching people to use this. I'm doing it myself. I, I had a bit of I had a bit of a breakdown. Um, I quit. Uh, I was luckily uh, I I'd, I'd found a beautiful piece of property on Hornby Island. Uh, cost and cost nothing. Uh, then uh, my family was you know I, I had a sculpture commission and my family topped it up for me. Uh, my mother wouldn't take it out of her name until I paid her off, and I never did until I didn't get it until she died. But it was, uh, um, I went there. I went there, and one of the reasons I went there, there's no building code, and I, I was free to, free to build. And as I say, I back about the cost of what housing is. I mean, I, the, then that property cost eight thousand dollars, and I, you know, I did all the work myself, and I scavenged all the wood, and logs from the beach, whatever. But I had a house, a really, a, you know, you can see it, you know, a nice house, thirteen thousand dollars. I mean, what is going on? It is just bizarre. Okay, um, so, so in in the process, and I, I'm I'm not wanting to. Uh, I'm not, I, I'm, not, I'm not wanting to work with resin. I, I, I sort of fall into, I go into sculpture, and I, I started, a, a, oh, oh, also I'm doing the whole thing with the squat duck. That covered like 14 years, overlaps, that's the 70s. This is, this is now we're in the 80s. Um, and I, I, you know, I have no idea why I was doing these things. But suddenly, you know, they're brought, suddenly it's brought out and it makes sense to me. I mean, look at this thing. You know, the, 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 that material is bitumen. I mean, it makes so much sense now. I, you know, what was I doing? That? I don't know why I did it. And the, the same with this thing behind, which is, you know, if you, if you read the text, it's man's laughter, man's slaughter, and it, goes, it circles around it. I mean, why, why, is, why, why is suddenly something topical? I mean, that's so icy. It's so... And this, this is so Enbridge. This is, this is so. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Anyways, I. I and, oh, and this piece, okay. This is another piece from that series. Um, many, many, I, 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 I did teaching now and then, and I, I, I got a gig uh, at U of T uh, lecturing in sculpture. And uh, I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> I, I had a bit of a, I had a bit of a dispute with, with certain art historians, and, and I, I just wanted to do something topical in terms of art history. So this, this is this is somewhat of th these images are taken from a specific famous text, that, which is black and white. I put it I put it on a Xerox machine, made the images, cast the the cast the the bots, and and, and sort of rearrange St. Teresa. It, it, to me, it's it's that point in uh, the Counter Reformation when 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 they they brought it all steps, and and Bernini was brilliant. I mean, he, he, in terms of a technician with materials, uh, like it's just astounding. I mean, he, he could use anything, um, but also you know. They, they 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 use they use sex the same way as used in contemporary advertising, and and that, that's that's kind of what this piece is about. Um, the okay, finally I can't stand being away from resin any longer. I'm really jonesing for it. So, uh, I I I go. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I get into it again. I, I, and my, the first, I, 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 I finally, I built a studio, I, 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 and I, I built a studio that I can use, it's, it's just open walls, a roof. Um, I wear a respirator. I, I rationalize that Glenn Toppings also smoked three packs of Jatans a day. Um, anyways, I really want to work with resin again. So, so the first works are, are, that I did are, are the ones behind there, which were almost almost, a, 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 almost cartoons on on uh, on the period of Russian art that, that I that I'm so attached to in, in, in suprematism. Uh, and, and then, <laughs> then uh, oh, um, I, 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 was, I was given a gig by Av Isaacs, who is my dealer in uh, Toronto, because uh, he, he realized I was, you know, always. In, see, he's, he's, he, he also dealt in Inuit art, and he uh, he had he had a, a nook chuck to uh, put on the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo. So he and he, he knew my sort of material skills, so he got me involved in it. But there, it's and going there, uh, I realized I had a great gallery, and, and I talked myself into a show at the at the embassy, uh, which I had a couple of years later, with with these works, which are called blanket statements, which was they're they're. Imagistic takes on uh, trading blankets with, with that dark center, um, so, sort of putting on the on the fact that uh, at that time, this, this is when I first went to Japan. That was six. That was nineteen uh, nineteen uh, ninety-one. Uh, is that right? I'm trying to get it. Anyways, when I first went. They were they were they were incredibly successful. They they you know they the Lexus and and every, everything they made the best stuff was Japan. And two years later they went through it. In that two years they went through such a big dive economically. That the, there was you know there was you, I, when I first there was no people you know living on the streets. When I went back there was people living on the street. So what's going down? It's it's like that that place crashed so quickly. But, but, but my idea was based on, when I did this, it, it was um, it was thinking, okay, I'm, they're giving us all this stuff. I will take trading blankets to Japan in, in, in reverse. And, and I, I made this exhibition, and it, it, it worked. It, it, it got me back in, uh, the, you know, the, just after that, the, you know, the Vag bought a big four panel piece. and. I, I'm I'm back. I'm ac actually making a living. I, I okay. Wrap it. Let's okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. The 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 other piece behind it is you know, it's, it's, you have to read the text to get the story. It's done. It's done with pasta and resin. Okay, we're going to the next. Yeah. Uh, again. Uh, okay, we'll go. We'll bring. We'll go to that process art thing. Um, I, I never start with a narrative. I, I start with material. The object is, the object is, uh, in, at least in this room, the the object is um, completed. I look at it and, and then uh, then I then I tell a story about it. So and, and the story is just to be a, a mnemonic for me to uh, remember what the process was. Like, like th this piece, you, which you can see, it, it, you get a closer look at it, it's got very, very thin silver and gold threads in it. And I, I, I was, you know, I, I love going to dress so and looking at threads. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I mean, I'd stretch them in these things for, I don't know, for just something. Anyways, and when I did it, I began to think about it. And I liked it, but I had to come up with a story, and I started. Okay, this is cute. But, you know, you, you can, does anyone remember that song, "Silver Threads Among the Gold"? Yeah, 
Yeah, and, and then, then, then I got into that, and, and I realized after studying, which I call this piece, you know, I call this piece Evan Rexford, and he's, he's a guy that wrote that uh, way back in the, you know, 1870s. Uh, but it, it became the most popular recorded song ever, you know, in its time. And you know, it, it was done on one of those hollow cylinders. But th then again, when, when you think it took until, that was, that was about 1903. Up until 1903, there was no concept of what music sounded like other, other than written notation. You, you just, you didn't know. From, from then on, people, you know what something sounds like, you can play it. Before that, people didn't know what music was other than notes and, and, until they could actually play it. I mean, that's way later, th the sound recording is way later than the camera. And it's made, yeah, odd. But I, I just, I didn't mean that when I started it. Uh, that, that's, there's another piece. Um, it's graphite crystals. I, I, tried to, I tried to make something as even as I possibly could. I, I spread the graphite crystals perfectly evenly. And then the polymer itself, as it formed long chain polymers, moved the graphite around and made the drawing. Th that is really processed enough. Uh, um, and, and much, you know, much the same in all these interviews. Uh, later, about six years ago, I, I started, because uh, Bo Shi Wong, that guy I mentioned, uh, way back in 1960. He started, you know, he, he'd, he'd been on my case forever to, to, you know, go with him to China, come to China. And I'm thinking, well, I don't want to go to China. What do we go to China for? And he said, well, you know, there's some really, you know, get you interested in ceramics. I said, I'm not interested in ceramics. I never was, come on. But he finally, uh, finally my, my neighbor in the, in the art co-op that, that I helped found in Vancouver, he, he, uh, he picked up on this and said, come on, tell him. This guy's a traveler. He said, I'll go with you. He packs my bags. We go to China. And um, it, tur you know, it, it turned out that uh, on the way, I, I began to see in museums there were these porcelain things. And eventually, Bo Boshi got us to the place where they're made. And you get sh large sheets of porcelain. It's just like buying a blank canvas and spray um, spray glaze on it. You get glaze in other place in this town where there's a whole bunch of glaze shops competing with one another. So you, you see these walls of wonderful glazes, and I spray it on, and and they fire it, and it comes out looking completely different than I expected. But the, but they're in themselves. They're making themselves again. This is process. I'll, I'll never, I'll never be a ceramicist. I'll, I'll never, I'll never know what I get, but uh, I take it and see how how it how it does relate to the resin. Okay, wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? <laughs> yeah. Yes, although you work this um, sculptural, it definitely has painterly feel and. Um, it's got these sort of um, sublime elements, um, kind of reminds me of Dan Flavin. Were you influenced by people that dealt with light um, or color in its pure aesthetic like that? Some of these larger American artists? Uh, yeah. I, I, here again at this university, I did, I did a course with B.C. Benny, and, and it, was, it was the history of, of, of uh, painting techniques. And, and we started with fresco, and, and you know we worked through everything. We made, we made our own oils. We we did acrylics, and at the at the end of it all, basically what paint is is it's a medium, and, and to hold pigment. So there's an oil, there's acrylic, but everything holds pigment. This stuff holds pigment, and and it's so clear that you can you can get such light coming from it that yeah, I'm I'm interested in light more than anything. Thank you. The, um, the glass kind of effect within the resin. The, the like it almost looks like oh. um, ice, ice particles. Oh yeah, so in, in, in every one of these uh, 
you, there, there's a similar to canvas. They're, they're like painting in reverse. I put the, the, the canvas on at the end, and, and, and that canvas is, uh, it's not canvas, it's spun, it's, it's, it's matted glass fibers, and you, you can make it appear or disappear according to, to the pigmentation or, or that you use. And some, uh, uh, like there's one where it really appears, uh, you can see around there where I very much emphasize it by, by putting a copper powder behind it. And it looks like I've done a very intricate drawing, but it's not, it's just the, the fiber. No more questions? Okay, thank everybody for coming.